Everyone has heard of the Wright brothers, especially if you're from Dayton. Genius inventors, owners of a bike shop, printers, and first in flight. But what many people don't know is that Wilbur and Orville had two other brothers and a sister. And the sister was the only one of them to finish college. Catherine Wright was a caregiver from the time she was 15, a teacher, a social secretary, a strategist, a trustee of Oberlin College, and an officer of the Wright Company, a friend to many, a wife to one. This is her story. Catherine Wright was born in 1874 in Dayton. She and her brother Orville shared the same birthday, August 19th. But despite Catherine calling him little brother all his life, Orville was actually three years older than Catherine was. There were more than 13 years between Catherine and her eldest brother, Ruchlin. She was the youngest child of Bishop Milton Wright and his wife, Susan Kerner Wright, and was called Spess by her brothers, an endearment meaning little sister in German, and Kate by her friends. Here's a photo of Catherine's fifth grade class showing her in the front row. When Catherine was almost 15, her mother died of tuberculosis, and this hit Catherine especially hard. Her father encouraged her to work through her grief by creating some sort of a memorial to her mother, and Catherine began to collect flowers to press into a small album, which she carried with her always. Susan Wright's death was hard on all the family, but for Milton Wright, the blow was felt both personally and professionally. He was a leader in the Church of the United Brethren and was called away often throughout the year on business, and when he was home, he met with church elders at the Wright home. It turned to Catherine to step into her mother's role and act as the hostess and head of the Wright household, a daunting task to say the least. But Catherine persevered and thrived, adopting many of the same strong and authoritarian personality characteristics as her father. The three youngest Wrights, Catherine, Orville, and Wilbur, were especially close, and some have speculated that it was when they were young that they vowed to never marry. More likely, it was just that they preferred each other's company. Catherine, for her part, was just five feet one inch tall. She was smart and had a great sense of humor, and unlike her brothers, she was very outgoing. One aviator, whom the brothers brought home, commented that Catherine had coal black hair, deep blue eyes, and a smile that could blind you. Expectations at the time were that one of the younger siblings would stay at home and care for the aging parents, a concept that's not a bad idea as I get older. Bishop Wright, however, also felt that Catherine should be trained for something so that she could support herself when he was gone. Once she graduated from Dayton Central High School, he sent her to Oberlin College to become a teacher. Oberlin was one of the first colleges in the United States to accept women, and it was the oldest co-educational college in America. Catherine took to it like a duck to water. For the first time, she was living with other girls her own age and intellect, making lifelong friendships with the vivacious Margaret Goodwin, a minister's daughter from Chicago, and her other two more serious roommates, Harriet Silliman and Kate Leonard. Catherine also met a young man named Henry J. Haskell, or Harry, who used to take his meals at the rooming house where Catherine and her roommates lived. Harry was the same age as Catherine, but two years ahead of her in school and a brilliant mathematician. Catherine was not a brilliant mathematician, and Harry tutored her three times a week. The two soon became fast friends. Catherine may not have been a stellar math student, but she had no trouble in her other classes and excelled in the classics, 
especially Latin and Greek. She set upon the course of training to be a teacher of classical languages. It was customary at Oberlin, as at other co-ed colleges, for men and women to pair off during their senior years. Harry Haskell had met and proposed to one of Catherine's housemates, Isabel Cunningham. Catherine, however, had already, at the end of her sophomore year, committed to a senior named Arthur Cunningham, no relation to Isabel. When Arthur graduated in the spring, he went off to study medicine in Cleveland, and whatever romance they had cooled. When Catherine suggested that they give it up, Arthur seemed relieved. Years later, Catherine referred to the affair as my narrow escape. Her father, Milton, never even knew that she'd been engaged. It had taken five years for Catherine to get her degree. She'd had to take a year off during her junior year to nurse Orville back to health after he'd contracted typhoid fever. Arriving back in Dayton, she applied for, but did not get, a teaching position at Steele High School. Her friend Margaret landed a teaching position in Dover, Ohio, and Harry Haskell started as a cub reporter for the Kansas City Star. It took Catherine a full year to get a job as a substitute teacher, 1899, the same year that her brothers began their aviation experiments. Being back in Dayton also meant resuming her role as head of the Wright household. She hired a maid, 14-year-old Carrie Kaler, to help with the cooking and the cleaning, and in many ways modeled her father's behavior as an authoritative taskmaster, riding not only Carrie, but her brothers Orville and Wilbur too. At the beginning of one school year, Orville asked Catherine for a list of the first week's victims among her pupils. He said, I'd like to see somebody else catch it for once besides us. Catherine's social life at Oberlin soon blossomed back on Hawthorne Street. She held parties and camping trips, went on bicycle outings, and held sing-alongs. Occasionally, you can see Orville at the edges of these gatherings, though he often appears shy and withdrawn. By 1901, Catherine was teaching Latin full-time at Steele High School. Since it was a required course for all students, she had the rowdy ones as well as the more studious. But they were no match for Catherine, who was naturally bossy herself and had four older brothers. She told her father, I had five or six notoriously bad boys assigned to my room. I was ready for them and nipped their smartness in the bud. It was during this time that her brother's experimentation in aviation became reality, and more and more people began to flock to the house on Hawthorne Street. Catherine watched it all with a mixture of interest, annoyance, humor, encouragement, and admiration. When Wilbur hesitated to accept an invitation to speak before the Western Society of Engineers in Chicago, Catherine talked him into going. She wrote to her father, he will get acquainted with some scientific men and it may do him a lot of good. Catherine really served as her brother's silent partner and demonstrated her importance to them in many ways. She ran and helped fund the household so that the brothers could concentrate on their aircraft. When the brothers began to sew the material for the glider wings, she complained about the crowded house and lack of space, but she also allowed them free reign. She even helped them market the plane. When they needed help at Huffman Prairie, she convinced her fellow teachers to help move the machinery from the brothers' warehouse. She became their executive secretary, helping them to secure a patent for their flying machine. 
Catherine immersed herself more deeply in their business dealings, and they depended on her, especially when they were out of town flying. She watched over the bicycle shop, paid the bills, deposited the receipts, and interacted with the shop staff and customers. Later, when the boys went to Europe to sell the plane, her responsibilities increased. She answered correspondence from newspapers and magazines about scientific matters, screened business offers, corrected stories, and handled all inquiries, both legitimate and crackpot. When Webster's Dictionary asked to publish a photo of the Wright Glider, she got the brothers' permission. While the brothers were away demonstrating their flying machines, Catherine held down the fort at home. She nursed her nephew Milton back to health after a bout of typhoid fever. After all, she was an expert after Orville's confinement, and she continued to teach full-time at the high school, a position that was beginning to sour in her mouth. The superintendent of the Dayton schools had decided that he could save money by reducing the salaries of his female teachers. Right around this time, Orville had a tremendous accident in Fort Myer, Virginia, where his passenger, Thomas Selfridge, was killed, and Orville himself suffered severe damage, both mentally and physically. Catherine dropped everything to race to his side and nursed him for six weeks in the hospital. By late October, Orville was well enough to return to Dayton, and Catherine tried to get Wilbur, still in France, to come home. But Wilbur had other ideas. He wanted both Catherine and Orville to sail for France, and he convinced her by offering her a paid salary as their social secretary. Catherine applied to the school board for extended leave and never returned. She and Orville sailed for France in January 1909. Once in France, Catherine dived into her new role as the brother's social secretary. She spent two hours each morning learning French, met with business prospects for lunch, spent the afternoon at the flying fields visiting the aristocracy and local dignitaries, and in general schmoozing anyone she could and collecting hearts as she went. Once, when preparing to meet the King of Spain, she practiced the proper curtsy with the wife of an English baronet. But when King Alfonso XIII arrived, she completely forgot herself and greeted him American style with a simple handshake and her brilliant smile. He was won over. Catherine flew for the first time while she was in France. She was only the third woman ever to fly behind Teresa Peltier and Edith Berg. Wilbur took her up many times and she wrote home to her father, them is fine, an inside expression meaning it was the best it could possibly be. Catherine seemed to be everywhere the brothers were. Rumors began circulating that she had sewn the machine wings, had loaned her brothers money, and even calculated the complex math equations. We know that wasn't true, but it didn't stop the speculation, nor did it diminish Catherine's popularity. People were fascinated by her, and they began to envision a warmer side to the notoriously shy brothers. Catherine became an international celebrity. When the Wrights left France, the French awarded all three of them the Legion of Honor, and Catherine remains one of few American women to ever have received this award. Catherine's popularity remained high upon her return to the United States. She was warmly greeted in Dayton, invited to Washington, D.C. with President Taft, and had a chance encounter with her old schoolmate, Harry Haskell, who had asked to interview Orville and Wilbur. He was granted the time, but spent much of it catching up with Catherine. 
She'd had to resign her position with the school because of the demands of being the brother's social manager, and they were as busy as ever. She became the director of the Young Women's League of Dayton, and she and her father became active supporters of women's right to vote. Outgrowing the house on Hawthorne Street, she also oversaw the planning and construction of Hawthorne Hill in Oakwood. In early May 1912, Wilbur returned home from a business trip to Boston, not feeling well. The illness developed into full-blown typhoid fever, and Wilbur quickly deteriorated. Since she had nursed Orville and their nephew Milton back from the fever, they had every confidence that Wilbur's illness would soon pass, but he only weakened. They were stunned when Wilbur died on May 30th and blamed his death on overwork. Nothing would ever be the same. Orville took over the position of president of the Wright Company and Catherine its secretary, but Orville's heart just wasn't in it. He ended up selling the company in 1915. In the summer of 1916, Orville took his father and Catherine on their first ever family vacation. They stayed at a cottage on Georgian Bay in Lake Huron, and Orville fell in love with the landscape, which reminded him of the solitude he had enjoyed in Kitty Hawk. Before they returned home, Orville purchased a 20-acre island, and Orville and Catherine spent two months of every year thereafter on Lambert Island enjoying the wilderness. In 1917, Milton Wright died. Despite the fact that his health had been steadily declining, his death still left a large void in the Wright household, and they decided to fill it by getting a St. Bernard puppy, whom Catherine named Scipio after the famous Roman general. They loved that dog, and when Orville died 15 years after Scipio had, there were still photos of the dog in his wallet. Not long after Scipio arrived, Catherine began to correspond with Harry Haskell. She and Orville had had more contact with Harry because of his position with the Kansas City Star. The Wrights were thwarting attempts by the Smithsonian to discredit the brothers' advances, and Harry had been writing and publishing editorials in the newspaper supportive of the Wrights' position. Then, both Catherine and Harry were invited to join the Board of Trustees for Oberlin College, and they came into more direct contact. In 1923, Harry's wife Isabella died of cancer, and Catherine began to console Harry. Her consoling turned to affection, which turned into love. Harry was first to declare his feelings in 1925, and at first, Catherine was confused, then excited when she realized that she felt the same about Harry. But her excitement turned to fear when she began to think about changing her life with Orville, when she realized that she would have to tell Orville. He didn't rush her. Harry didn't press her. He visited Dayton and at Lambert Island. When Orville was out fishing, they finally kissed. By mid-August, they decided to get married. Haskell's grandson, Harry, writing in his book, Maiden Flight, said, they were two Victorian people caught up in a passion that neither understood. They were swept off their feet by each other. But telling Orville was another thing. He had absolutely no idea what was going on right under his nose. Catherine felt that she should be the one to tell him, but she kept coming up with excuses, and pretty soon six months had passed. She couldn't bring herself to do it. She finally asked Harry to break the news, and he did in May 1926. Orville sat silent, saying nothing. 
When Harry left the next day, Orville descended into a full-scale sulk. Catherine panicked, thinking her family would condemn her for wanting to leave Orville. But she was wrong. They were thrilled for her. Older brother Lauren tried to talk to Orville, but he wouldn't listen. He was dependent on Catherine, both in a business sense, in home life, and socially. Plus, she had kept a very big secret. That was probably the worst of it. She was his best friend, and she was leaving him. He acted as though she had died, refusing the use of Hawthorne Hill for her wedding. As Catherine remarked to Harry, I am sure no one can imagine how inseparable the relation is now between Orv and me. I can't desert him now. Friends, however, convinced her that Orville would come around, but he didn't. Catherine did marry Harry Haskell, though, on November 20th, 1926 in Oberlin. Orville did not attend. From the wedding, they traveled directly to Kansas City, bypassing Dayton. She never saw Hawthorne Hill again, although she did correspond with Carrie, their housekeeper. So she kept up with Orville and what he was doing. She was forever pained by the split with her brother. She said, I go to Oberlin again in three weeks for a trustee meeting. I'll not stay longer than my business keeps me since I can't go home to Dayton. In my imagination, I walk through our Dayton house looking for little brother and all the dear family things that made my home. But I never find little brother and I have lost my old home forever, I fear. But she was extremely happy in her new life. Harry's family welcomed her with open arms, particularly his son, Henry. Harry's professional star rose too. The newspaper was sold, he became a major stockholder, and was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for editorial writing later in 1944. Harry and Catherine had planned to take a cruise to Italy and Greece in 1929, but just before they were set to sail, Catherine came down with pneumonia and her condition deteriorated quickly. Lauren arrived from Dayton and then contacted Orville and told him to get himself to Kansas City. Orville arrived on March 2nd, a day before Catherine died. Harry escorted Orville to Catherine's room and announced, Here's Orv, Catherine. Do you recognize him? Yes, of course, Catherine whispered. Catherine Wright Haskell died on March 3rd, 1929, having married Harry Haskell a mere two and a half years earlier. She was 54 years old. It was Orville who asked Harry if he could bring her back to Dayton, and so she's buried in Woodland Cemetery with her mother, father, Wilbur, and Orville. In the 1930s, Harry gave a bequest to Oberlin College to construct an exact copy of the Fountain of Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, a sculpture he and Catherine might have seen had they made it to Italy. On top of the fountain is a winged cherub playfully clutching a fish. Harry and Catherine had a love of the classics, and the meaning to them would have been clear. The cherub is actually a puto, the mythological Greek being associated with Cupid and love. The fish is a dolphin, a favorite of Apollo, the god of wisdom, whom he sent to guide sailors. So the sculpture symbolized Harry and Catherine's relationship, love and wisdom. Catherine, the right sister, was a wife, a confidant, a trustee of Oberlin College, and a fine Latin teacher, flunking many of Dayton's leaders, according to Brother Wilbur. She lived in an extraordinary time, yet conquered many with her wit and winning smile. 
add Catherine's name to the list of jewels in the Gem City's crown. Thank you.